This year marks the 30th anniversary of a landmark inquiry into Aboriginal deaths in custody in Australia. But unfortunately, many believe little progress has been made and the situation has actually worsened for Indigenous Australians three decades later. Data show Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have shorter life expectancy, but a higher rate of child mortality, unemployment, and prison incarceration. So what causes the situation? What should the uh, Australian government and the international community do to promote and protect the rights of Indigenous people? To find out more, I'm joined by Anna Tangen, an independent current affairs commentator, Professor Chen Hong from East China Normal University, and Dario Gabi, CEO of GabiTraders.com. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qin Duo. Okay, welcome to the show, gentlemen. So here are some facts according to a report by The Guardian. Uh, you know, there were at least 270 frontier massacres over a period of 140 years of Australian history uh, as part of a state-sanctioned and organized attempt to eradicate indigenous people. The Aboriginal population went from an initial estimated 1 to 1.5 million to less than 100,000 by the early 1900s. So, Dario, you know, how do people you know, respond or do people, are people fully aware of this part of history? People are becoming more aware of this part of history. For many years, when I was growing up, for instance, this was not generally known. In certain parts of Australia, the north of Australia, it was more recent than it was known. So it's a significant influence both on European settlement, Europeans within Australia, but also on Aboriginal people who are beginning to be able to show that these are real problems and that these are significant issues and ongoing issues. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Chen Hong, uh, if you look at this part of history, for people, uh, Aboriginal people, who were affected by, I mean, negatively by this part of history, how, uh, you know, will this legacy somehow, you know, become a burden or attached to their daily lives, uh, in, even today? Well, I think actually in the 1830s, as we know, in Tasmania, you know, the uh, Aboriginal population in Tasmania was significantly you know, decimated with the uh, massacre, that notorious massacre was genocidal because of the insularity of the Tasmanian, you know, uh, island. So almost the entire, you know, in the uh, indigenous people on the island was literally, you know, obliterated. The genocide was all around, as we know, you know, the uh, 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 student generation, for example, was purported to physically and, uh, uh, you know, culturally stop the continuity of the Aborigines as a race and also as a culture. This is a historical trauma for the indigenous people to think about who they have been and who they are. So a few years ago, there was an Australian feature movie called Samson and Delilah, you know, which depicts the uh, destitute and, you know, desperate lives of the younger generation of the uh, Aboriginal uh, people in the uh, outbacks, a generation of, you know, young people with a hope, you know, petrol sniffing, child abuse, sexual assault, theft, prejudice. These are, you know, all the vestige of the uh, historical, you know, atrocity their forefathers have suffered. So I think history is something we have to understand as something that is indelible, imprinted in their collective, you know, subconscious and hereditary, you know, the uh, culture. The current generation, in particular, the Australian government, need to think about this in a more profound, you know, profound way, you know, rather than, you know, paying token attention. Monetary payments won't literally close the gap when the gap remains in the mentality of the political and social culture. Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, if you take a look at the current situation, for example, uh, about the Ar Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people, they, compri they comprise like 29% of the adult prison population. Well, they only represent 3% of the total national population. And uh, basically people say, you know, Aboriginal people have the highest rate of incarceration in the world. You know, what, what's behind the, the such high rate of imprisonment? Well, when you break a culture, uh, well, you know, you set out to destroy it, uh, it has uh, repercussions. You've seen this in Canada, uh, the indigenous people there, you've seen this in the United States with the African Americans, uh, you, you saw this in South America. Uh, it takes a long time to recover uh, from this. Uh, you know, this, this is a situation which is particularly sensitive right now uh, around the world because people are looking at what are the consequences of trying to change uh, 
uh, people. And this is very different from trying to teach somebody English in a trade. This was literally trying to stamp out a culture. And it's, uh, it's not something, as, as my colleague said, that you can change by throwing money at it or lowering a, a flag half-mast or saying, I'm sorry. Uh, this took generations to uh, create, and it'll take generations to solve. Mm -hmm. So, Dario, usually if you look at this high-end prison rate, you know, what kind of crimes do, say, Aboriginal people, uh, you know, they were put into prison, you know, and what kind of, uh, uh, you know, violation of the law? Well, we need to remember that most of these crimes are coming through poverty, and they are crimes associated with poverty. Poverty in itself is created through illiteracy, which leads to low unemployment rates. Now, I should note that I've worked with Aboriginal settlements and communities for more than a decade, and these issues have been constant over that period. So how do we get out of this situation? And that's something that's been addressed just recently in the last two days with the Northern Territory signing an Aboriginal Justice Agreement, which is looking at methods where we can bring together customary law and Western law to get better outcomes, to help rehabilitation, to help prevent Aboriginal people getting into the justice system in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's a long-term project. That's a long-term project. In 1991, uh, there is an uh, uh, inquiry uh, made by the Australian government you know, into Aboriginal deaths in custody and made hundreds of recommendations uh, after that uh, survey, uh, the investigation, uh, in order to address the crisis. But uh, three decades on, few of the 339 recommendations have been implemented. So, uh, Chen Hong, why is there the failure to implement these recommendations? Yeah, as I said, you know, I think of uh, for problems such as the uh, Australian Indigenous people, you know, you know, you know the paying lip service or making token gestures are no good. It simply won't work. There needs to be a fundamental and systemic change in the uh, political, you know, social and cultural fabric with which, you know, only with that. Could there be some substantial change? Aboriginal deaths in custody has been a long-standing issue, and in spite of the talk about changes, no significant action has been, you know, taken. Which is why there's still such high rate of Aboriginal incarceration and even deaths. It is true that Australia is a multicultural society, and for over uh, 200 years there have been, you know, groundbreaking changes, and improvements. But intrinsically, you know, white Australia, you know, man mindset and white supremacism. Has you know have been you know at play since the mid 1970s. Racism and other you know social and racial prejudices have been lurking in consumers. But once there are conditions favorable, I mean you know conditions that are favorable, you know such undercurrents would become you know, resurgence. Mm -hmm. So what what's um, you know the plan? Um, because there's a goal that uh, until 2031 the incarcerated uh, is you know to reduce by 15 percent. Uh, will they be able to achieve that? I seriously doubt that because as I said, you know, paying lip service or making to token gestures, these are simply superficial, you know. We need to have some kind of policy change, some kind of, you know, real change that can really, you know, to be put in place that can really, you know, bring some kind of real change instead of, you know, simply making some kind of, you know, blueprints which never, you know, crystallize. Mm -hmm. So, Dario, what do you think the government need to do in order to really put those recommendations into action and make some uh, you know, real improvement on the lives of Aboriginal people? I think there are several points there. First is that this is a state responsibility, not a federal responsibility, so the actions taken by individual states varies. And secondly, the uh, justice system or the incarceration system has many flaws. So there are also many European deaths in custody as well. So there's something that's wrong there. And then I would point again to the Northern Territory where our Attorney General is a woman of, she's an Aboriginal woman from uh, Northeast Arnhem Land. Um, so the involvement of Aboriginal people within the formal structures of government helps to push solutions to these sorts of issues. We need to have more Aboriginal representation within our government processes and within our bureaucracies. That varies from state to state. Some states have a higher level, a higher proportion of representation, whereas if you move to New South Wales and Victoria in the southern parts of Australia, Aboriginal representation within the administration is very limited, and this slows down the process of implementation of those sorts of policies. 
Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, if you look at this, uh, you know, uh, the issues uh, obviously associated with the Aboriginal people, uh, when they come to Australia, people often think of this term like a stolen generations. Uh, as part of the efforts for uh, this assimilation or forced assimilation, kind of similar with uh, the residential schools in Canada. You know, there's a lot of talk about that. Tell us more about these stolen generations. Well, the, the idea there was to, you know, the, the land was taken uh, basically by force in all, all of these countries. Uh, Aborigines and American Indians had no concept of land ownership. You might as well say, you own the sky. They said, how can you own the sky? It belongs to itself. Uh, and then uh, Western uh, colonials came in and they brought with them their legalist things. They also brought disease, alcohol. Uh, in the case of China, it was drugs and uh, also uh, change. They said, we're going to civilize you and therefore you must adhere to our system. Uh, this kind of idea that you know, one society can impose on others uh, what they believe is correct, regardless of the cultural differences, etc. So I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with my colleagues a little bit. This is more lip service. I've heard the exact same things said about African American and Hispanic problems in the United States. I've heard about it, heard in uh, South America, uh, Canada. You can go on and on. I think what's really called for here is a concerted effort, much like China did with eradicating extreme poverty. When you start making the government accountable and having individualized plans for, in, uh, for people, for the families, uh, for the areas, villages, reservations where they live, that will make a difference because it's concrete. All this, oh, you're represented, therefore things will change. No, because the money uh, won't be there. Uh, there will always be, it's a hot crisis now, we'll throw some money on it and we'll forget about it later when the next crisis comes. This has to be something which is uh, undertaken in a structural manner to undo generations of tragedy. We'll take a further look here for, about the solutions. But before that, uh, Dario, I know that uh, from 1989 to 1995, you worked in the Northern Territory in remote communities uh, of uh, you know, Aboriginal people. You know people from the stolen generations. You, you met people uh, from the massacres of the 1930s. Uh, tell us about uh, you know, what impressed you the most. What impressed me most is their commitment to culture and their connection to country. We tend to, to dismiss this connection to country as an idea because it doesn't fit within our Western ideas of land ownership and so on. So the concept of song lines, of this long-term connection with country is most important. So the challenge becomes to be able to establish an environment where there is a recognition and a respect for the existing culture and at the same time, the benefits, for want of a better word, of the dominant culture or the Western culture, because the traditional culture ends up in a system of poverty without education. There is little future. There is no employment. There is no positive outlook going forward. We can't continue to live in a way that we lived 40,000 years ago, but we need to find mechanisms that allow us to survive, to keep those connections and survive within the 21st century. And in many areas, particularly in the Northern Territory, there are varying degrees of success. Well, Dariel, do you find uh, the impact, uh, you know, all the burden, say, uh, because they are part of the stolen generation, uh, do you see, still see the impact on their daily lives when you were there? Oh, very much so. There's no question about it. There is uh, a disconnection, there is an alienation. But it falls into two categories. For many people, it's that disconnection, that alienation, that feeling of rejection, that loss of culture. But for some, and these are the powerful people in many ways because they are moved into the Western system of governance, people like Jacinta Price, for instance, in Alice Springs, they've been able to take the advantages of education and use that to push effectively from within government and within bureaucracy to improve the delivery of services to restore Aboriginal ownership of the decisions that are taken and the way that services are delivered. And again, because this is state-based, there are differences in the way that this has been achieved throughout the uh, states in, in Australia. Some are much better than others. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Chen Hong, you know, in order to solve the problem, the Australian government, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, uh, recently announced a plan to disperse 
uh, 378.6 million Australian dollars to indigenous survivors of a forced assimilation. Uh, what do you think about the plan? Well, the uh, closing the gap pr program is a gesture, which I think should deem the uh, acknowledgement from the international community. However, you cannot buy forgiveness. You cannot change history, you know, heal the wounds. You cannot let the indigenous people forget about the past with the give outs of money. You know, changes need to be, as I said, you need to be substantive, systemic. They need to be policy changes, solid changes. Changes could be gradual, but they need to be solid and with substance. Another thing is about the timing of the reparation plan. The Morrison government is undergoing serious, you know, distrust because of its, uh, you know, handling or mishandling, you know, failed approaches to uh, deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccination, you know, rollouts. There's going to be the election next year, the federal, you know, parliament election by next May. So people cannot, but you know, become dubious of the motive of this gesture by the Morrison government, whether it has any you know ulterior political motivation. Whatever we think, I think it is the most important to look at the matter seriously and bring about real changes that could affect you know some kind of and also improve the status and outlook of the people, you know, the Aboriginal people. Daria, what do you think of the plan? You know, uh, will the money, uh, more than 300 million Australian dollars, uh, help solve the problem? Or is that enough? It won't, have solved, it won't have solved the problem, but it is deeply, deeply appreciated because it is an acknowledgement of issues which have existed for decades. It's too late. It's too late for many people who have passed away. And this is a tremendous area of regret and concern for those who have received uh, these payments. These, there is a genuine feeling of the ability to empower Aboriginal people. There is a constant move and has been for decades to devolve power back to communities. It's not just a matter of throwing money at the problem. That's certainly important because without money, you can't take the action that's required. But when that money is allocated to Aboriginal organisations and Aboriginal organisations are in charge of setting the strategy, setting the structure of employing Aboriginal people to provide Aboriginally designed solutions to the problems that they face, then the allocation of that money is particularly useful. But you are correct, throwing the money willy nilly without any plan is not effective at all. But when it's put into the hand of Aboriginal organisations to be deployed in a way that is consistent with Aboriginal aspirations and desires, then it's more effective. Mm. Again, in some states it's more effective than it has been in others. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a break and we'll be back right after this. Uh, obviously, uh, if you take a look at, uh, you know, the, um, it's not only about the Australian issue. The UN has uh, criticized basically the Australian government for several times for its uh, treatment or ill treatment of the Aboriginal people. And then there's uh, 2020, uh, Black Lives Matter also uh, inspired the people, uh, in particular the Aboriginal people, to take to the street, to, to have their voices heard about their uh, treatment over there. Uh, do you think? you know, actions like this will have impact on improving or increasing the awareness about the uh, situation of Aboriginal people, Anna. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> as I think we all, the panel would agree that awareness is not enough, uh, that you, there has to be substantive change. Uh, I, I don't know that this is uh, necessarily political by Scott Morrison's uh, government because uh, Aborigines are only 3% of the population. They do not vote that often. Uh, they're not a political force. Uh, it's, it, maybe he's trying to put a kinder face on uh, his government and uh, some of their actions. But in the end, uh, there's no substantive plan. Throwing money at it and saying, look, that's it, we're done, uh, you know, it's, it's not done. Not until you have a real plan uh, to deal with these people. And this is the same thing with Black Lives Matter. Uh, initially, it was defund the police. But where is the highest concentration of crime? It's in the African American neighborhoods. So they need police. The question, the issue is they don't need police who regard them as animals to be caged. And this is the same issue with Aborigines, uh, with indigenous people everywhere. Uh, Professor Chen Ho, you know, another issue, uh, rights issue, I would say, uh, related to Australia, you know, people often hear of is this, um, uh, the, the, the refugee, let's say, asylum seekers. According to a report from 2013, 
the Australian government has forcibly transferred more than 3,000 asylum seekers to offshore processing camps in Papua New Guinea and Nauru. You know, these asylum seekers spent years living in these substandard conditions. Uh, and uh, so it's very controversial, I know. And, um, you know, like, what's the way forward to really solve the issue? Well, first of all, you know, the off off offshore you know, handling of the refugees and also asylum seekers was a way to shirk responsibility for the Australian government to keep the uh, refugees off the continent, outside the borders. You know, so they are technically not on Australian soil, therefore, you know, not a domestic matter. The inhumane treatments and substandard living conditions are appalling. There was this recent incident in which a young girl had to be, you know, separated from her asylum-seeking, you know, family on uh, uh, Christmas Island. I think they were from uh, Tamil, you know, to receive medical treatment in a post hospital, it was heart-wrenching, heartbreaking to see the scene, you know, on the television. So I think there should be more humanitarian considerations when dealing with the refugee issue, to deal with it with more care and empathy. You know, Australia needs to have more proactive cooperation with other countries to fight human trafficking and people, you know, smuggling. But when, you know, dealing with your fellow human beings, you need to act like a human being, not in a cold, you know, blood way. But why, you know, doesn't the Australian government uh, just accept them, you know, inside the Australian territory instead of having them processed uh, in the territory of another country? Because actually, you know, when they are offshore, they are not an Australian matter. They're simply, you know, away from the Australian soil. So they actually, they think actually it is a kind of way that they can, you know, technically exclude that, um, you know, physically from Australia, you know, the, the, the Australian continent. That is the way actually the Australian governments have been, you know, you know, handling this issue from, I, I think, from the you know, Tony Abbott's, you know, years, you know, to be, you know, keeping them away from from Australia. But this is really, you know, because actually, when you're dealing with, you know, building those facilities on Nauru, on you know, the Christmas Island, you know, when those, you know, living conditions are really substandard, and also, you know, when the medical facilities are really, you know, not so adequate, this creates a lot of problems. And also, you know, children, you know, there are children, you know, who are actually being kept in those facilities that is really appalling living conditions for children, not good for their growth and also for their mental health. Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, if you look at that, uh, you know, keeping the asylum seekers or refugees from your territory, keeping them from afar, uh, probably this is not the, the most human way of treating our human fellows. Uh, but then it was actually uh, somehow being copied or to be copied by other countries. For example, Denmark is doing something similar and the UK is considering a similar moves to keep asylum seekers or refugees somehow away from their territory. And what, what is going on uh, in this world? In the rich countries are basically saying no to people from uh, poor regions. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes back to the issue of if, we, if you didn't start wars in other people's countries, you wouldn't have refugees. Uh, there, are refu there is a, law, a convention on refugees. You're supposed to accept them. Uh, but what has happened is uh, monocultures feel that they do not want other people. Uh, and a lot of it is racist. Uh, they see it as, you know, these other people, they're dirty, they're poor, we don't want them. Uh, in Denmark, maybe that's one thing. I mean, they have a fairly uh, a uniform... Um, culture. But it's ironic in the United States, Canada uh, and Australia, which are immigrant nations. These are people who all were unwanted uh, in the most part. Uh, many of them were prison convicts who were forced to go to Australia or face uh, death penalty. Others were uh, legitimate settlers and they, they did their thing. So it's not fair to you know, paint the whole area, but uh, they, they moved there because they wanted a better life or an opportunity to start a new one. And these are the exact same things that these uh, immigrants want. Now, Australia is not a small place, it had, but it's a huge place with a very small population. There's plenty of land out there. There are opportunities. But this idea that because they're different, we can treat them poorly. If as long as they're outside our borders, it doesn't matter. We saw that with Abu Ghraib in the United States. Uh, if we want to mistreat uh, prisoners, we take them somewhere to a black site and just you know, set the dogs on them, literally. Well, Dario, what do people think of this, uh, you know, very controversial uh, topic, uh, asylum seekers being processed, uh, you know, somewhere beyond the territory? We call it dog whistle politics. So when you use a dog whistle, the dog automatically comes. So when you run with fear, fear helps to win elections. And if you're running for fear 
promoting fear from foreigners, from refugees who might pose a threat to your community, then it's a very successful election strategy. It was first used by uh, Prime Minister Howard in what was became infamous boats overboard, where it was said that women, with, women and children were thrown overboard um, from refugee boats so they'd be rescued by Australians. It was a complete lie, but it was very successful in winning the election. Remember, Australia is becoming a hermit state. We are busy cutting ourselves off from the rest of the world in relation to COVID. So this move against refugees, which has been going on for many years, is part of this long-term narrative for Australia, who is rather frightened in many ways of the rest of the world. What we need is faster assessment of claims. We need more generosity, and there is generosity in the Australian experience and the Australian character, and we need to avoid these tricky moves to exclude some parts of Australia from Australia for immigration purposes, but they still remain in place for taxation purposes. The hypocrisy remains fairly strong in these approaches. Mm -hmm. Well, Dario, you mentioned the COVID, obviously, because of the, you know, a lot of controversial uh, issues surrounding the COVID. There's a rising, let's say, uh, you know, discrimination or racism against uh, Asian uh, Australians, like in the U.S., Asian Americans. So what the government is doing to somehow, you know, um, to protect Asian uh, Australians and to basically let the, the public know that we need to treat our fellow Australians equally and with respect? Many people would claim that they are not doing enough. And certainly the levels of racism in the southern parts of Australia is increasing. And we're not seeing concerted action to counter this. However, this has to be put back in the context of a general mismanagement of the rollout of vaccines within Australia, uh, a mismanagement of the responses to COVID. The responses being to close down the country, to stop immigration and most recently to even stop Australians leaving Australia uh, to attend to business and other sorts of things. So there is, as has been described by the opposition in Australia, we have become another hermit kingdom. Mm -hmm. Well, Dario, you know, last question, uh, not the least, obviously, because we are talking about the, you know, the treatment of this small group of people, Aboriginal people. Um, part of that is a cultural protection. Uh, for example, in Australia, people are saying that the country is suffering one of the largest and the most rapid loss of languages. Uh, of the 145 indigenous languages still spoken in Australia, 110 are critically endangered. Uh, so what the government is doing to stop that kind of trend? It's a vexed question in terms of support for languages, because some of these languages, due to past history, are only spoken by three or four or five or six people, a handful of people. So when the language ceases to become part of everyday activity, the language itself will decline. So that's one part of the question. The second part of the question is, can those languages be retained alongside the, the dominant European language? And when you go to places like Arnhem Land, you work in Central Australia, you work in communities in the northern parts of Queensland, then those languages coexist side by side. So for instance, in the Northern Territory, there are certain parts of uh, the day that are devoted to teaching in the native language, and then the rest of the day is devoted to teaching in English. And that policy was introduced by an Aboriginal Minister for Education uh, who came from Arnold Land herself. So it's a very vexed question as to the utility of language, whether it would die out naturally because there are simply not enough people speaking it, and the ability to maintain that language and what the value is in doing so. It has to be useful for day-to-day -day activity. Well, with that, uh, we are coming to the end of the show. Many thanks to Anna, Daryl, and Professor Chen. And also thank you for watching and see you next time.